Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the Build Better Summit. Um, I hope uh, since I've been in the previous two sessions, I hope you're not getting too tired of me. Um, but I promise uh, this is my last session and I'm going to get out of the way here. Um, I was looking in the chat box and someone wrote, these sessions are so good. And I indeed, I think they are. And I also think that this uh, summit definitely wins the prize for the best music. So whoever is programming your DJ list, um, give them my kudos. Um, I'm coming to you. My name is Ted Howard. I'm the president and co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative. Um, I'm coming to you from the Mile High City, Denver, Colorado. I know most of you are at sea level or close to it in San Diego. Um, uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and um, uh, I don't know what to say. We've got a very diverse uh, panel, and I'm holding the space of the old white guy. So that's um, enough said about that. Um, San Diego, where y'all live, is fertile ground, as many cities are, but San Diego for sure, fertile ground for innovative solutions to entrenched and intergenerational inequities. Uh, so in this next session, uh, with our marvelous panel, we're going to explore three exciting and innovative partnerships uh, in the region that aim to build better in the San Diego area. Uh, joining me are three gentlemen, Dr. John Castillo, Executive Director, Director at Walking Shield, uh, Jason Pagiao, uh, President and Chief Executive at the Asian Business Association of San Diego, and Reverend Harvey L. Vaughn III, Senior Pastor at Bethel African Methodist Episcopal AME Church of San Diego. Uh, today, what we're going to be discussing here, uh, distinct from our previous sessions, is we're really taking the community view before we were a little bit higher in the level of the of, um, difference making. And today it's from the community up, um, putting community voice at the front and center of any solution. And particularly in this session, solutions desired and designed by black and indigenous and other people of color. In other words, community residents, many of whom are bearing the brunt of the inequities of our system and who are themselves designing the way through. Um, we're going to be discussing uh, efforts such as that address affordable housing and homelessness, uh, developing infrastructure for small and micro tribes, and bolstering more than 100,000 small businesses owned by people of color. All of these are elements of part of the rich tapestry that we need in order to attain a vibrant and equitable economy. So um, we'll just begin. Um, Dr. Castillo, if you would, uh, let's begin with you. A, a brief overview of the uh, project underway, your work at Walking Shield. And then after that, we'll move to our other panelists and just begin a free ranging discussion. Over to you, John. Sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Dr. John Castillo. I'm the executive director for uh, Walking Shield Inc. We're a nonprofit. Uh, I've been around for, uh, again, since 1968. We provide a, a lot of different services, just a quick history and then a quick thing about our services and then right into what we're doing in San Diego, all within, I think, 10 minutes, if that's okay. Um, Walkinshill was founded by uh, Phil Stevens. His name is Phil Walkinshill Stevens. Uh, Walkinshill is a name given to him and a naming ceremony by the Rosebud Sioux people. He visited uh, Pine Ridge in uh, South Dakota, which is known as Ogallala Lakota County. It's the poorest county in the whole United States. So when he visited this tribe, which is still pretty poor, he changed his whole life. He was a defense contractor here, so he sold his business and uh, started Walking Shield, basically. Um, our services include, very briefly, uh, we have a scholarship program for students. We've given away over $2 million in uh, scholarships. We provide about four to six scholarships in the San Diego area. Uh, the balance of them are in Los Angeles and Orange County. Uh, we provide humanitarian aid and a holiday a gift program. So we uh, provide about $300,000 a year of that. A lot of, some of the tribes benefit from the, uh, our toy program, humanitarian aid. So uh, we have a couple coming up, picking up uh, this week and next week. We have a housing relocation program. We're, only the, we're the only nonprofit in the United States that has first right refusal to excess military homes. 
So we've moved 1,235 homes to 15 reservations across the country. Um, we have also a unique relationship with the Department of Defense. We work with a program called Innovative Readiness Training, started in the mid 90s. We were involved since the beginning. So we can do infrastructure work in healthcare on reservations, again, across the United States. And we work with the poorest of the poorest tribes. Uh, we also do, uh, we're friends from uh, one site. We do also do free eye exams and eyeglasses. Uh, we have one scheduled out in San Diego, hopefully, uh, uh, with COVID going away soon, I hope, that we'll be doing that in 2021, uh, next November. And uh, we also do an employment training service here in Orange County. So I want to go straight into our work in San Diego. We've been uh, working in San Diego for quite a long time. I'm not just giving out scholarships to the young people there, but also doing some infrastructure and healthcare as well. So uh, we did a lot of uh, a lot of road work over in uh, Mesa Grande. That's a reservation. It's kind of like in, in, in the middle of a canyon. So their roads were all dirt and it's very unsafe. And there's about 30, 40 households that live down there. It's a fire trap, basically. So with the National Guard and the Army, we were able to come in and, and fix their roads towards Sutherland Dam. So it makes it safer for them. Uh, and also, uh, we've done a lot of work in La Jolla. We've worked on their roads, uh, also on their water tanks. Um, and Los Coyotes a little bit, uh, and some uh, work at San Isabel as well. Uh, we recently uh, formed a tribal uh, consortium down in San Diego to uh, work on um, COVID-19 uh, and post-COVID-19 recovery. Um, so we developed these five-year plans with tribes. It's a kind of a guiding document because with tribes, our uh, tribal councils change, our department heads change. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a living document that uh, the tribe can utilize with Walking Shield and its partners to uh, look at economic development, to look at housing needs, to look at community facilities and everything that revolves around that. So uh, our partners in our consortium that we just developed this past year is uh, the La Jolla tribe. They need more road work. They're working on a tank. We're gonna build a fire station there and some economic development activities. San Isabel, uh, road, road work, uh, water issues, uh, community facilities, housing pads, economic development, less coyotes. Uh, again, all these guys need road work. Uh, they need their uh, captain facilities upgraded. Uh, their water tank is uh, uh, polluted, basically. They got uh, all kinds of bats and, and things flying into the water tank. So that needs to be replaced. The water sewer lines, uh, the posta, uh, uh, there's health issues there, housing. Again, water and sewer lines, economic development. So what, you, what we do is uh, we work with the Department of Defense with some of these programs. So we'll build these five-year plans that includes the military. You know, and the military is accepting five-year plans. So we're able to look at things that we could do in uh, 21, 22, and so forth with the tribes to prepare them for the work that's going to be conducted on the reservations. And... Uh, so our partners in this process of the consortium, besides the tribes, and of course, Walking Shield, you know, I've been a good friends at, at San Diego Grant Makers. They've been working with us for over a year now. Uh, the California National Guard, who's promised uh, infrastructure and healthcare in California. The Department of Defense Innovative Rentist Trading Program out of the Pentagon, who's been doing a lot of work uh, with the National Guard, of course, uh, the Army, Air Force, and uh, Navy. The Alliance Healthcare Foundation, the University of San Diego, and the Mission Driven Finance. So some of those are our partners in this effort to help these tribes in San Diego. I know we know that it'll grow as, as we continue our work down there. And uh, that's basically about it in a nutshell. All these things are, are, um, are a lot more detailed that I'm sharing with you, but I want to allow some time for my colleagues to share all the great stuff they do. Thank you. Great, thank you, John. And we'll come back and hear more um, I was really happy you mentioned um, the Pine Ridge Reservation. I had the opportunity a few years ago to work with the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation up there and, um, uh, uh, and help uh, start a Native American worker-owned construction company to do work on the reservation. So fantastic, and thank you for your work. Uh, 
Let's see, we're going to go to uh, Jason next and hear about the work underway at the Asian Business Association of San Diego. So over to you, Jason. Thanks so much, Ted. A pleasure to be here. A real privilege and, and honor for me to take part in this uh, summit. Uh, the Asian Business Association uh, has been a strong fabric of the Seneca community for uh, just over 30 years. Uh, we provide no-cost counseling, educational resources, and workshops uh, as part of the San Diego and Imperial Small Business Development Center network. Uh, our organization also provides advocacy for the over 30,000 Asian and Pacific Islander-owned businesses and entrepreneurs who call San Diego home. Uh, so our organization, uh, our approach to the organization has come from my personal experience, uh, not just as a small business owner, but also my experience, experience owning a Filipino restaurant as immigrants and uh, essentially what was not afforded to them. So we took a, a community-based approach to our organization and partnered with uh, API cultural institutions to reach those historically uh, underserved or left behind. So upon uh, taking this role about a year and a half ago, I'm fairly new to the space. Uh, I spent my first uh, probably 60 to 90 days uh, interviewing uh, legacy members, uh, stakeholders, and investors, and trying to understand uh, our region and the place uh, that we fit in. Uh, and what I found uh, was that a lot of my peers uh, representing other ethnic business associations and organizations uh, we're not only uh, we're not at the table essentially at the same time, or we were at different tables, uh, and our messaging, our resources were mostly divided, um, and we were fighting for uh, what small investments, um, you know, were basically given to us. Um, so uh, we all sort of had a small discussion on, you know, what can we do to work together? How can we make sure that we're at the seat, um, have a seat at the table together? Uh, so we've since uh, last fall uh, in October formally uh, formed uh, what's now known as the Strategic Alliance of ethnic chamber that's comprised of the region's three largest ethnic chambers of commerce uh, organization, the Asian Business Association, the Central San Diego Black Chamber of Commerce, uh, and the San Diego County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we, we have been fairly successful in advocating for resources for our communities throughout, especially the pandemic, uh, and ensuring that our policymakers and investors are keeping uh, minority and businesses uh, top of mind, and, you know, and making sure that they're providing them uh, business coaching and mentoring services in a variety of languages, uh, that are tailored to be culturally appropriate in order to uh, earn the trust within uh, our minority communities. Uh, a lot of has transpired since then uh, throughout the pandemic in terms of who we partner with and who we collaborate with. As many of you are aware, um, during uh, not just in our uh, good times or just regular times, I think in, in, in times such as these, um, our communities historically get left behind. So in approaching a lot of the funding that comes down, um, from the top or any of the stimulus money or any kind of uh, COVID-19 disaster relief resources, um, it's it's a fight. It's it's very difficult to make sure that we're top of mind, uh, you know, because we don't always and easily have the access that others uh, might uh, that are um, a lot more acclimated or a lot more civically engaged. So uh, sort of something happened organically over some time of us uh, being aggressive in, in getting in front of policymakers was uh, we informally uh, formed what's uh, now known as the San Diego Economic Equity First Collaborative. And, and much of the work that we're doing has gone uh, beyond just the three ethnic chambers of commerce. Um, in, in short, it's a field level collective um, that provides and gives voice and access and assistance to uh, the diverse business communities that operate within the San Diego region, uh, especially along our uh, cultural and aging um, uh, corridors. So I'll, I'll pull up here real quickly the, the mission of the uh, collaborative. Uh, as it is today, uh, it's the, the mission of the San Diego Economic Equity First Collaborative is to give voice to the diverse business community in advocating for economic justice uh, in the San Diego region. Uh, San Diego Economic Equity First members consist of the San Diego and Imperial Small Business Development Center Network, the Strategic Alliance of San Diego Ethnic Chambers of Commerce, business improvement districts, promise and partners, community-based organizations uh, that represent San Diego's region's uh, communities from concern, uh, urban aging corridors and opportunity zones, uh, and we're also supported by philanthropic partners such as uh, grant makers. Uh, some of our strategies that we've implemented and are continuing to do are engaging uh, diverse business community voices around, uh, as you mentioned, economic justice issues, providing a unified voice from the diverse business community to promote issues uh, that affect the communities where we reside, uh, strengthening uh, the network of partners and facilitate collaborations between organizations, community leaders, and philanthropy, and educate and mobilize the public around local, statewide, and federal issues, uh, improve our commercial districts by working with uh, bids that are identified in promise zones and opportunity zones, organizing events, workshops, and other convenings to give voice for the diverse business community, and meeting with policymakers, as I mentioned, regularly to educate them about uh, our efforts. 
Um, so that's in a nutshell, some of the work that we're doing. I think uh, what's compounded over uh, the last several months and transpired is, is um, a togetherness. And I think for us being able to essentially take the space or at least not just um, be present, but be able to build ourselves in a way that we're much stronger uh, going forward in the future, not just for now, but as we know, uh, communities of color and minority owned businesses technically or, or typically get left behind uh, in situations like this. And we just want to make sure that uh, our voices are heard and that we're organizing ourselves uh, together. So that's much of the work that we're doing. Fantastic, Jason. Um, very exciting. Thank you for that. I, I grew up in uh, Los Angeles. Now, it was a long time ago, but um, we were completely unaware of this sort of thing taking place in those days, and perhaps it wasn't. This may be the new San Diego. So I'd like to go now to the Reverend Vaughn uh, of Bethel AME Church um, and um, uh, let you talk about the kind of uh, great work you're involved in, and then we can discuss some of the cross-cutting themes uh, from the presentations. Right. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to say, Ted, you've been doing an outstanding job uh, leading uh, the conversations from each panel discussion. And I think um, everyone that I've been listening to this morning has uh, helped me have a broader view of how we can get some of the work accomplished that we all are trying to do. Um, my name is Harvey Bond. I'm a third generation AME pastor, and I pastor a historic African Methodist Episcopal Church in San Diego. We actually are the oldest black church in San Diego. We were established in 1887, and um, we have been doing ministry in the community for quite some time. Uh, one of the things that we are working on right now, we're in a, a partnership with grant makers. Uh, to provide um, new housing for homeless veterans. Uh, we're building 16 new units on Imperial in Logan Heights. Our church is located in Logan Heights. And the community in which we're located in has changed significantly uh, since the inception or founding of our congregation. At one time, we were in a community that was really a Black community or African-American community. And over the years, that has changed significantly. We're presently a black church in a Latino community. And so we have to, we have had to continue to look at ways to minister to the needs of our congregation and the community in which we're located in. We do provide uh, daycare for the community. Uh, we have a program where we're feeding the community uh, we've been feeding, especially during this pandemic, uh, with schools being closed and people being out of work. That number has gone up exponentially um, as far as providing food for residents of our community. Um, I don't have to tell anyone that's on this line that housing is a real opportunity, affordable housing. I'm not going to say it's a problem. I like to say it's an opportunity for us to do uh, the Great Commission and do the real work of ministry within the communities, regardless of who the people look like and regardless of whether or not they are members of Bethel Church. Within San Diego, we were building about 6,000 units of housing per year. We need to be building 12,000 units to accommodate the existing population. One of the challenges is that um, the, the land is so expensive in San Diego and in many communities where we can build um, not just single family residents, but we need to be. I think we've lost Reverend Vaughn. I'll give him a moment. However, Many people are saying, "Need it. you can build it, but don't build it in our community. So this is one that we have, uh, we continue to run into. Uh, we're in a wonderful partnership with grant makers. Uh, we're, this will be our first new development um, in years, 15 units on Imperial. And the uh, traffic that we're really trying to provide housing for homeless 
pardon me, homeless veterans, uh, as we, this would be the first many developments we will be doing around the uh, church, the community where our congregation is located. And we would like to be able to do, replicate what we're doing in other parts of San Diego and other parts of uh, California. I think we have an opportunity to uh, provide safe, affordable housing, not just for our veterans, but for and individuals. Uh, many people that are working within the Logan Heights community are working multiple jobs just to provide good housing for their families. And so if you work two or three jobs and then you're, you're paying out 50 to 55% of your take home pay just to provide housing, it makes it very difficult for families to put themselves in a position where they will be able to purchase their own home. And so I think that um, we have a tremendous opportunity to do uh, a great work of ministry within the community of San Diego. And there's a scripture, and uh, I am a, a pastor, so of course, you know, I'm going to talk about what the Bible say about how we should be helping uh, the people of God. If you look in uh, the book of Matthew 25, when uh, Jesus gave a parable, and he said when he came back that he would be separating wheat from tear. And he said that uh, he would put, uh, when he was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. The righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will say and answer to them saying, assuredly, and as much as you did it, not do it into one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So I think that we, the body of Christ, have a command from God, from Jesus Christ, to serve the needs of his people in this present age. And I think for the church, uh, very often churches are only looking at those that are members of their congregation and not considering the community that the church is located in. The church has to serve the community in this present age. And even though the Lord didn't say, well, when did you see me homeless and you didn't provide housing? I'm going to add that to it because uh, to be able to provide safe housing is extremely important to families. If you can get a family off of the street and into affordable housing, safe clean, affordable housing, that changes the trajectory for those children. It changes the trajectory for the parents. Um, I managed a nonprofit for several years when I was in St. Louis, Missouri. And one of the things that we found out from providing um, housing is that when you track the test scores of children that are put in safe housing, their test scores went up. It changed their perception of what the possibilities were for them. And so I'm very happy that uh, Bethel Church is not only looking at the members of our congregation, but we're looking at the community 
and we're looking for ways in which we can partner with other nonprofits uh, to meet the needs of the community at large, whether it's housing, uh, we need job training and placement, um, and we need uh, a lot of things within black and brown communities. And one thing that you can notice, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, usually um, the African-American and Latino communities have been underserved and our communities are being impacted. Our businesses are being impacted uh, very often, even with the uh, funds that were made available through the PPP, uh, many black businesses and Latino businesses did not access those funds or were not able to access those funds. And so the African American community and other uh, communities that are considered minorities are really being impacted, um, not only by COVID-19, but the effects of it. Many of our businesses are closing because we don't have the revenue to stay afloat. We don't have the revenue to buy the personal protective gear that is needed to keep the doors open. So um, our church is partnering with other nonprofits within the community to make sure that the resources that are being dispersed from the federal government um, and the banks that our communities are gaining access to those funds so that we can continue to move forward. So um, I've been listening to each of the panelists and I'm looking forward as we move forward, as we go forward, um, I'm looking forward to working with some of you that I have not previously been working with uh, to make sure that we are doing uh, the mission that Jesus Christ has given the church. And um, that's about all I have at the moment. Um, any questions or comments? I'm looking forward to answering those questions and responding to them. Thank you, Reverend Vaughn. And thank, thank you all. It's just, um, it, it's so good to hear the, how build, building better, um, you know, shows up in our actual neighborhoods and communities and places that have suffered historic distress. Um, I wanted to ask, I had a couple of questions and feel free not to respond to them and say something else you want to do. But, you know, at the Democracy Collaborative, my organization, we use a frame of what we call community wealth building, mm -hmm. that we need to create assets and capital in our communities. They're democratically controlled and in which everybody broadly shares and uh, benefits from and so forth. And, and while that's not the language you've used, it seems to me that's very consistent with the approach you're taking. And it's really a looking at the, focusing on the assets of the community and how to lift them up and make them stronger and more vibrant, as opposed to what a number, many people in economic development do, which is look at the deficits mm -hmm. and just try to address the deficits. And I wondered if you think, if, if I'm, you know, uh, if, if I'm understanding what you said correctly, uh, what kind of power do you think comes from a kind of asset-based approach in economic and community development rather than focusing on the deficits solely? And um, anyone who would like to speak, I don't know, Jason, if you might want to start and then John and Reverend Vaughn. I think Reverend Vaughn cited a few things in terms of what's been missed or at least uh, for our community in, in throughout the pandemic. And I could tell you that, you know, as the money was, we know that First Come, First Serve doesn't serve those who need the help the most as consistently. Um, mm -hmm. What we experienced, uh, I think, throughout the pandemic, our organization alone out of the SBDC network uh, helped our businesses receive over $30 million in uh, disaster relief funding. So PPP, IDLE, uh, our, our uh, smaller local grants, uh, that came down from the CARES Act, like the City of San Diego Small Business Relief Fund, and then the County Small Business Stimulus Grant. And what we consistently found that not only did it reward those that already had the resources within the system, it was that those that had cultural barriers, or at least language barriers, uh, were definitely left behind. So let's say you needed to uh, apply for a grant, and then you had to have or provide supplemental docs. 
or document all those documents, uh, you know, might not have been in language for those folks. So we had to quickly hire translators uh, that we already didn't have uh, in certain communities that are are mostly left behind or or those that aren't usually top of mind. And trying to get them those, and it was all reactive, right? Everything was just, you know, why weren't these things thought up at the at the front end? Well, because it's more difficult, it costs more, and I think it's important to note that it's it's not necessarily cheaper to invest in a community uh, of color, but at least if you do it and you do it right, you're front loading those resources to make sure that we're not left behind and then that we are uh, playing an economy in, in an equal playing field. Because I could I could tell you from experience, not just with my organization and these small businesses. But when you invest in organizations like ours, we do the work that we do is not only sometimes cheaper, and I think that's a fault of our community a lot of times, but it's better. Our work ethic that we bring to the table, sure. amount of passion, our why is so much stronger than so many others. Uh, but we just need to be given that chance. We need to be given that opportunity to invest in our people. And when you do it, I guarantee you the, the end result is going to be so much better, and you're going to be so much more thrilled to see how much more our community can grow. And, and how much more we help others. Thank you, Jason. Um, Dr. Castillo, do you have something to say in this regard? Uh, I think um, asset building is very, very important because the, the tribes know their deficits. And yeah. so we'll be, be able to attack these deficits. Uh, a big thing on these reservations is infrastructure, you know, roads, access to clean water, wastewater, uh, disposal, uh, housing, all those things are, are important. So when we look at assets on some of these reservations, one of their assets is land. And yeah, mm -hmm. they have land, you know, so there, there can be a lot of development on these lands. Like, you know, some of these facilities, for uh, some of these tribes want a community facility that can be turned into a business in incubation program. You know, some of these tribes need a facility for the veterans, for their wakes. You know, there's a big need for community facilities on the reservations. Mm -hmm. uh, on some of these reservations, we're meeting in some, some small trailer, you know, that's, and that's their admin quarters, you know. Uh, so I think for, for the tribes, and that, I think that's why this five-year plan that we've evolved over this last 30 years working with tribes across the United States, is we know that we need to tackle uh, the things on reservations in a holistic way. We have to look at their housing needs. We have to look at to work on their housing needs. We have to look at their infrastructure needs. We have to look at their assets, you know, besides land. You know, some of these tribes have some other assets, like uh, Las Coyote has a nice campground, so it's just La Jolla. Uh, so we look at some of their assets and build on those assets. Um, but again, infrastructure is extremely important in these rural communities. And uh, that's why these five-year plans I look at just the infrastructure, the economic development, housing, community facilities, and all culturally relevant to these tribes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Reverend Vaughn, any comment on this asset question with as it regards your work and your community? Sure. Um, one thing that I, I would like to say, um, I think one of the things that we need to do, we when we're considering wealth building, um, we need to have real conversations with the residents of the community. Uh, very often for minority communities, people come in with an idea of what is needed for that community without having a conversation with the residents of the community and asking them what your needs are and what do you have in mind? How can we help improve your current situation. So when we're talking about wealth creation, uh, one of the major ways that people create wealth is through home ownership. Many of the people that live in Logan Heights don't even have the opportunity to own their own home is so far away from where they are because they're working three jobs just to pay rent. And so even if they realize that, you know, if we could put them in a sit situation where they're not just paying 55 or 60 percent of their income in rent but putting them in a situation where they can eventually purchase and own their own home that will create equity so when their children are in a position to go to college they don't have to have all these student loan debt they can pull equity out 
finance their children's education. Maybe if they want to start a new business, they can pull equity out of their home to start a new business. So I think we need to have real conversations with the residents within the community to assess their needs instead of looking at a specific, a specific zip code and saying, this is what the needs are. Here's what we're going to do for you. So that's one of the things that I think we really need to consider uh, collectively. We need to have some town hall meetings with the residents of the community and really uh, determine where they are and then provide the wraparound services. So what does wealth creation look like to somebody that has never heard that phrase? So um, I, I think from the perspective, even when I was listening to John, and we've spoken previously, um, the Native Americans and many of the things that they're dealing with on the reservation, when you talk about uh, some of the health crisis that they have on the res, same thing in the African American community. When you talk about mental health, when you talk about drug addiction, alcoholism, domestic violence, poor housing, or lack of adequate education, those are many of the same things that we're seeing in African-American and Latino communities. And so I think when we're having conversations about creating wealth, uh, we need to have people that are really serious about making a long-term investment in these communities. There is no easy fix. It's not a cookie cutter solution. And so I, th I think we have a lot of great minds um, on these various panels. And I think that we're going to have to have more conversations like this to really determine how we go about creating platforms and programs and implementing them that are going to be beneficial to where people are. For some people, they may be three years away. For others, it could be five years. For others, it could be seven. But if you can really show people, display to them, hear what their needs are, what their concerns are, and then say, okay, I hear what you're saying. We're gonna partner with you to create the steps so that you can move forward. And even your children and grandchildren will be in a better position. I don't know if that really- If I, if I may, Reverend, um, I think to to a lot of what you're speaking to in terms of like that long term investment, those that are seeking to 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 have more minority equity investments, is it is it just politically convenient? Sure, I think there are certain things, and we are seeing a lot of one time investments, whether it's the the fees donated by our larger banks from the PPP. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of one time money, but are our communities only going to receive that money one time? Are we continually going to be in a position where? It's not just one time that this is a long term investment that you historically the investments have gone into places that are more traditional, that are sort of a safe landing spot. But, you know, does that really move the needle? Does that really address the, the issues uh, you know, concerning our communities? Absolutely not. So how do we keep our foot on the gas? How do we make sure that we're always refilling that tank or how do we make sure it's always, you know, the electricity is always running? I think from that point, we need to make sure that our, our well is always filled. And, and, you know, how do we continually stay on that? Because once the economy gets good again, you know, are we going to be top of mind? Not usually. Uh, you know, how many times do we have to go through this until we actually come together and say, you know, who is actually being represented? Who is making those investments? Um, and, and I think that's the long-term strategy is making sure that it's not a secondary thought. It's not a, well, this is politically expedient and it's politically convenient, right? It looks great. And we're seeing a lot of pandering for those that make investments. Do it because you want to and you understand it, not because you know it makes sense right now. And I think that's a big concern for a lot of us. Well, Jason, I, I think you're spot on with that, especially when you're talking about this should not be a one and done. Uh -huh. I think that we have to have corporate sponsorship at the table. Um, you know, when I consider Logan Heights, you know, we're in a food desert, really. Yeah. Uh, a lot of time, the services that we need to help people within our communities are just not there. And so, you know, when you talk about the... Um, some of the things that we're dealing with are just because of the resources are not there. And so if you don't have adequate grocery stores, if you don't have the adequate services um, or dental care, if you don't have adequate health care in your community, 
I mean, these are just basic services. Mm -hmm. So that's a major uh, that's a major dilemma. But the corporations. So why is there not a target in Logan Heights? Why don't we have a real grocery store in Logan Heights? It doesn't make sense to me. Why don't we have um, adequate, a, a good clinic for the community right there in our community? We shouldn't have to go outside of the community to have the services that we need. Why are the streets so bad in Logan Heights? Have you, anybody driven through there lately? I mean, it doesn't make sense. San Diego is, is like the most beautiful city in the world. And, in, in, in this country, it's like the Hawaii of the states. And yet, if you go to La Jolla, it's great. If you drive over to Golden Hill, which is just a few blocks from where we are, yeah. streets are, are nice. There's a Target over there, though. There's a grocery store there. The resources are there. So I concur with you. It should not be a one and done. We have to have the corporate sponsors around the table that are serious about investing in our communities because what they will find if they put the investment there, they will get a great return on their investment. You know, so that's where, where, where we're getting here, it seems to me, we're really, this is really at the heart of the new form of economic development that we need. Uh, you know, there's too many projects and too many initiatives and too many one-off efforts. And what we need is serious investment that places capital in our communities where it's rooted there and can produce the kinds of outcomes that you're pointing to are lacking that can consistently produce that. Um, just to take a moment in Cleveland, Ohio, where I lived for the last 10 years before I relocated here, um, I was part of a team that worked with the city government, local philanthropy, the Cleveland Foundation, Community Foundation, and some of the big anchor institutions like the Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals and, and the community. And we went out and really talked to people in community. What is the primary need you you see here, and it was to a person, it was jobs, 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 because we're talking about communities where the uh, uh, unemployment or people living below the poverty line, 35 to 40 percent of the entire population of the city. And these are all communities of color and overwhelmingly black. And we realized we could create jobs, but it was going to be tough to create the right level of income. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we created a for profit business network of worker cooperatives mm. so that in addition to people's salary, they could share in the profits of the company because they are were being drained out to absentee investors, maybe living in New York and so forth. So, so the end story here is we have about 300 people so far working in these businesses, 50% of whom are returning citizens, ex-offenders of various kind. Everybody hired was unemployed, essentially. Um, and this year, in our, one of our uh, companies is a uh, industrial scale laundry facility that does 20 million pounds of healthcare bed linen for the hospitals. Um, we've had two profit sharing events for the people in that company that total something like $400,000 they're divided among the workers in the company. And that company is loyal to the community. It's capitalized there. It's going to stay there. People's children are going to be able to work there and make a decent family supporting wage, be owners of the company, share in profits, participate in the board of directors. And I think where you're pointing when I hear it is these are the kinds of things we need to build in our communities rather than all these sort of one-off projects and now there's an enterprise zone and now there's the next thing, the next thing. We need to control that capital for the ends of the community. So sorry to get on my high horse there, but when I heard you talk, that's what I'm hearing. Um, like a winner. Let, me, let, let, let me turn since y'all, just like my organization, maybe a little less relevant for you, Jason, since you're in the business community, but 
philanthropic dollars are really important to support this. And, uh, you know, God bless philanthropy. My organization wouldn't exist without it. But one of the things that I find is so many, so many foundations, they're just interested in, uh, it's kind of like projectitis, mm -hmm. you know, one off things. And it seems to me what you all are talking about is strategies that are multidimensional and complex and rooted in community and, um, and can lead to business development, which is not usually thought of as a philanthropic concern. So there are funders on listening right now um, uh, to this dialogue. And, I, I, you know, what's your wisdom to them? I mean, they're also looking, well, how do we make a bigger difference with our dollars? Uh, what do you have to say to them, given your experience? And maybe, um, maybe John, since you were, have been talking recently, um, uh, what's your advice to them? Um, I, I can give you an example of one foundation that we uh, work with. Uh, the California Wellness Foundation, which I know one of the panel members was from there. Uh, they take more of a holistic approach you know, when you're promoting healthy communities. You know, like Reverend was saying a little earlier as well, you know, how can you promote a healthy community? You don't have a house or you live in overcrowded conditions. How can you have a health community if you're suffering from illnesses or don't, bad dental care, oral health care? I mean, how, how can you live, you know, how can you, uh, Get educated if you have bad schools or not even school supplies. Some of the reservations we work with, you know, they they teachers pull money out of their pockets to buy school supplies for these kids. So if you look at you know housing and healthcare and economic development, you know it takes a, a holistic approach to uh, helping these tribes. These in our, our case, and um, you know I, I I don't know it's just very important you know the, as as our friends here, you know. When we're doing this stuff, it needs to be sustainable. Correct. It's so important to ensure sustainability. And that's why we built these five-year plans with these tribes in the effort to ensure it's sustainable. You know, once we build the roads, who's going to take care of the roads over there? You know, and so forth and so on. I think there's so, some great ideas out there in business incubations. You know, there is a handful of uh, very wealthy uh, gaming tribes in San Diego. You know, why not develop businesses that you know, in, in our on reservations that can sell to the tribes, napkins, plates, pins, whatever. And we can do that. And so it'd be, you know, Indian buying from Indian, you know, support our Indian businesses. The employers, you know, those those tribes are some of the largest employers in San Diego County. Mm. I know in Riverside County, for instance, Pachunga is the largest employer in Riverside County. So there's a lot of opportunity to work with these uh, uh, gaming tribes who have done quite well to bring uh, a lot of support, not just on reservations, but off reservation communities as well. If I may uh, add, tack on to that, I think you were suggesting like a bi-local program, right? Where we're supporting our own our own ecosystem uh, within each other. And I think that's something that's um, you know been at least talked about now uh, with, with certain folks who are, who, are, who are decision makers or policy makers. I mean, even to that point, you look at the city of San Diego's, um, uh, I know they're working on it now, a disparity study, less than 1% of uh, their contracting had gone, to, and procurement had gone to small businesses and women-owned businesses in the region. That's that's not right. And I think I think that, you know, while they're initiating that study now and we're taking a part in all that, you know, how do we continue to emphasize by local programs and 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 supporting keeping that money within our communities. I think you're absolutely right about that. That is something that is so missed uh, for many of us. Yeah, here, here. Reverend Vaughn, any comment? And then I'm going to ask one last question, I think, as we wrap up here. I'm in agreement with both with what both of these gentlemen said. Um, I think what we would, with all of these great minds that are on the panels and listening in, especially for the donors, I think that you all have a tremendous opportunity to invest in communities that other people are overlooking. Mm -hmm. There is a tremendous opportunity within these communities to provide training and job placement for businesses for the long haul. And we can and, and that's and that's where the donors come in. 
a lot of the people with the nonprofits, the churches and the nonprofits are doing work. Uh, very often, we just don't have the revenue to do the work that we would desire to do. And so the donors have the, the funds available. And again, I think we, we need to really have some town hall meetings with the community, residents of the community, to assess their needs. And then uh, the nonprofits that are doing the work can partner with the donors to create communities. We need to be looking at it from a holistic perspective. And so the investment needs to be, I love what you said earlier, Ted, about the, uh, the co-op. So that's a tremendous way of investing in a community, uh, providing jobs that are going to be there for years to come. So I, again, I think that um, we need to really be sitting down and coming up with long-term plans for what we're going to do. And for some donors, they may just say, okay, well, I'm not willing to invest with you for the next 20 years, but I will give you what you need to get this started. And so that is an option. Everyone is not gonna be the partner for the long haul. But for those that are willing to, to really sit down uh, with us and help us create a plan and a strategy for the communities in which we're serving, they can also be replicated in other places. What you did in um, Cleveland did, could be replicated mm -hmm. here in San Diego. We don't have to recreate the wheel. And so when you talk about um, infrastructure and creating roads, John, then who's going to maintain it? Well, that creates an opportunity for training for someone on the res to maintain the roads. That's an opportunity for paid internships to learn how to maintain and upkeep the roads, and then they could move right into permanent employment. So I think we have to be looking at it uh, with a different lens, not one and done, but from a community perspective, in long-term planning. Yeah, amen to that. I guess I said that to the Reverend, amen to that, Pastor. Uh, I'd like to, a, a whole bunch of questions are coming in, both on my phone and on the chat, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, community consultation and building trust and all that, and I, I know you'd have a lot to say about that, but, but if I could, uh, in this last, a uh, couple minutes. I, I'd like to get your thought on something different. I, I've just moved out west to Colorado in September. I lived for 10 years in uh, Ohio, as I said. And you know, um, that's kind of Trump country. Sure. Um, the Obama country, but <laughs> it's became Trump country. And, you know, my, my view is the system we live in is extraordinarily uh, powerful and um, successful at dividing us. So we got all the white folks who say, well, the problem is, you know, over there and it's the black people or the brown people or the indigenous people or, you know, and there's this sort of divide. And how do we, I'd, I'd really like your thoughts because I'm grappling with this. I, my personal view is if we're going to really transform this country, we have got to find a way to have a multiracial coalition. And I know there's historic inequities. I think Ronnie Galvin in the first session is absolutely right that we've got to come to terms with reparations with all of that. And yet we've got to find a way. There are a lot of you know working class whites in places like Appalachia that are also hurting. How do we bring them along and not have them feel like, well, this is just for those folks, but you know, I'm going to align myself with the Trumps and the powers that be. Um, and you could tell that this is live and unrehearsed, so I'm grappling with this question. But I'd love your wisdom or your thoughts on that, including you're off base. It's never going to happen. Any of you have a thought about how we move this forward in a big multiracial way? I have some thoughts on that. I think that you know, what happened organically in our role of forming the strategic alliance with the, the Black, Hispanic, and Asian chambers, that collective was just something that 
you know, it's been done before in other parts of the state, but to the magnitude that I think we brought it has changed, um, I think, how people see us and how they work with us. It's not something where they feel like, okay, I just got to put a little bit of money in and then I satisfy, you know, my CRA investments here or this and that there. It's, it, it, you're, you're investing in people collectively. And then I think all of us all, it's, it's interesting having all of us, all the CEOs working together. We're always calling each other, hey, this just came down the pipeline. Let's work on this together. Or you know, this is new money. How do we approach it with our philanthropic partners, like sending good grant makers and making sure that you know there, there's equity in the way that it's distributed and that we're working together. Um, take for example the Black Business Relief Fund, which was founded with uh, both the Central San Diego Black Chamber of Commerce and grant makers. They made the requirements so that it was easier for these businesses, uh, minority-owned businesses, to access that money. And then the the fund ended up uh, expanding from the city of San Diego from their uh, CARES Act money. And being able to have funds for small and disadvantaged businesses opened up to more people. I think when you work together and you sort of, people will give you the benefit of the doubt if you show a united front or at least a coalition of people, because then you're already joining something that's moving and you're moving forward. I think when you come together um, with diverging or at least different interests, all of a sudden people go, it's easy for me to get on board with that because I'm just not divisive and it doesn't become a fallacy of one or the other. It's there's a bunch of people together and I'm just coming on board. I think that's a, a way to, to make it easier for people to just get their foot in the door to be able to buy in if you are not of that, I guess, demographic, so to speak. Um, but, you know, it, 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 I think it's up to us to make it uh, not just, you know, let people be aware, but to make it easier for people to come on board. It's, it's about addition, right? And I think for us, the more we come together, and add more, more people want to be part of that. Great, thank you, Jason. We got maybe uh, John, Harvey, one minute each, your thoughts before we wrap? Sure, um, um, I think you get an important word as far as trust. You know, you gotta trust on that investment, you know. Now I'll give you a, a very quick example. You know, I, I was good friends with the Surgeon General uh, in the Obama administration, Margaret Benjamin, and we talked about preventive care you spend money on preventive care, it's a lot cheaper than what's going to happen later on with acute care. Mm -hmm. A lot cheaper. So if you believe in that investment, there is a payoff, and it pays off for all of us. You know, like Reverend said, a clinic there would, would be a big plus. You know, and it, it's it got to believe in this trust. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've here, the Reverend. <laughs> Reverend Vaughn? You know, I, I think, um, man, you... You really put it out there, Ted, I tell you. Here's the thing, everyone. Um, I think what we have to really begin to, I, I think we could begin just by asking a question. What do you want for your family? And what do you want for your children? How do you want your grandchildren to live? What makes you think black and brown, Native Americans, and other indigenous people don't want the same thing for their children. Mm. Because I think that's really what it comes down to. We want the same thing that any parent or grandparent wants for their children, for their grandchildren, for their mother, father, for themselves. Just the opportunity to live in a safe community. Well, I, I'm not concerned that when I leave the house, you know, my family is going to be safe. So I think that this has to go. It's easier to say it's their fault. Yep. They're not doing anything. They don't have anything. Just pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. I've heard that. So I, it just annoys me. And I have to remind people, well, the people you're talking about don't even have boots. And you're saying pull yourself out by their own bootstraps. I don't know if the people that are following that uh, train of thought are ever going to really move or see other people that don't look like them as even being worthy of having safe water, affordable housing, access to training that's going to give them a real job where they can take care of their families. Because some of the people that are there that I want it to be equal. Yeah. Remember the, the Trump, President Trump ended diversity training in the federal government. He shut it down. Yeah. And I want things to go back to where they used to be. I don't want it to be a level playing field. So we have um, 
in America, I don't think we've ever really dealt with the systemic racism and the impact that it's having on black people, brown people. It took an eight minute video of a man being murdered for people to say, hey, did that really happen? Yeah. How often is this happening? And so it's going to take a lot of conversations. Uh, we're going to have to peel the scab off. And it's going to take a lot of conversations like these. It will take real um, investment within the minority community, a real investment. For the donors on the line, you have to put your money where your mouth is. That's from Missouri. That's the show me state did. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end. <laughs> Let me say, I don't live in San Diego, <clears throat> but I'm involved in the movement for a democratic and equitable economy. And I feel I've met three new partners in that movement today. So gentlemen, uh, Dr. Castillo, Reverend Vaughn, Jason, I really want to thank you for this. Um, I, I, I've been looking at the chat boxes. Um, people are getting a lot out of this. And I just want to say for myself, very humbly, I've gotten a lot out of this conversation with the three of you. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for your commitment to the people in your communities and to the all of San Diego. Um, it shines through very powerfully. Uh, I'm told we're now at time um, and that we're going to have a scheduled break. Uh, followed by uh, a session called Resourcing the Transition to an Equitable Economy. That could be the put your money where your mouth is conversation. You may, may want to attend that, Pastor. Um, um, the, the final session will begin at uh, 2.25, so that's in a little over 20 minutes. Uh, during that session, thought leaders from across sectors will discuss how we resource the shift from the current economy that's failing so many of us towards an economy that is just and equitable for all. So in the meantime, everybody take a break, take a walk, stand up, sit down, jumping jacks, whatever, uh, <laughs> stretch, uh, check, your, check your phones for messages. And um, everyone, please come back at 225 for the final session of this marvelous summit. And again, thanks to the EDC and the San Diego grant makers or as we now call them, Catalyst, for hosting this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Ted, you're doing an outstanding job. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. God bless you. Let's work together to build a, a greater community. Thank you. Thank you. See you all right. 25. So long, everybody. I know. Bye.